Right. So, so the question I want to ask you is, you, you said, you told somebody, that when you wrote this book, you, you wrote a draft and you read it and you realized you'd, you'd left the anxiety out. And so it took a whole other rather depressing draft, a year, to put the anxiety back in. And it was a fascinating experience. What did you mean by the anxiety being out of the book? Yeah, um, well, I, it came very fast and I was enjoying the speed at which it was coming. And what happens there, and, and you're, you're wanting to know what happens next. There's quite a lot of incident and plot in this. Um, and you, you're not quite sure how you're going to resolve it. So that you want to get to the end. And you keep thinking, well, I'll fix that later. And then you, re you realize that it was all needed fixing. It was all perfunctory. That you didn't get it up to that level where you can let it go with a you know, clear head. And it's true that I hadn't been, you know, writing is, for the, for the writer, fiction is almost down the middle, and my father and I used to agree on this, um, anxiety and pleasure. Um, and it needs both. And if, it, if, if you write a whole book uh, chuckling to yourself, complacently to yourself, it's not going to be any good. And if you write a whole book in a funk, it's not going to be any good. It has to be a mixture. And I didn't sit down and think, I've got to put the anxiety in. But, you know, by Christ, I did feel very anxious about bringing this up to... Uh, so you, you have to panic. Uh, even you, even Martin Amos, as he writes, is panicking once in a while. Once in a while, yeah. And you have to... And when, when it's going as bad as it ever gets, you have to say... Uh, to yourself, this is a this is a terrible book. But th then again, so so are all my other books. Uh, and then you can you, you're you're sort of already climbing out of the hole. But you have to you have to get to that. Relativism point. is a fantastic thing. It, it really has saved. No, you better read some of it. And, and then okay, we'll come uh, well I'll just read it for a few minutes. Um, and this is. This is sort of page 67. And up till now, Lionel's just been a uh, very violent, but not very successful criminal um, who spends half his life in prison. Um, but then he has a you know, bit of luck. And this is the refrain that you get on three occasions during the book. Who let the dogs in? That was going to be the question. Who let the dogs in? Who let the dogs in? Who? Who? It was as he was mucking out, which is to say, it was as he was passing his spoutless kettle of shit to the aproned orderly that Lionel Asbo first got wind of the fact that he had just won very slightly less than 140 million pounds. Yeah, you've had a bit of luck, apparently. Don't know what, said Officer Phipps. It wasn't such a bad bloke. The light wants a word. You'll be sent for. The who, said Lionel. The light, you know, light of your love. Gov, love, love, gov. That's rhyming slang. Jesus, you need you head seen to, you do. And rhyming slang's all crap. Officer Phipps continued to go about his tasks. According to him, you've had a bit of good fortune. And he was well pissed off about it and all. Yeah, what's this then? You'll be sent for. Lionel turned to his cellmate, Pete New, and said, drop charges. Look like they've seen reason and drop charges. Yes, Lionel, could very well be. Dorwart was a remand prison for those awaiting trial or sentence, and its inmates were banged up on a colorful array of charges. Banged up for non-payment of alimony, banged up for serial rape, banged up for possession of marijuana, banged up for knifing a family of six. Well, let's hope so, said Pete New. Pete New was banged up for having a fat dog. Banged up for having a fat dog, said Lionel, on his first day there. I know, said New. Sounds stupid. Yes, well, 
12 reprimands and five final warnings from the social. Tinkerbell News Basset Hound was 14 stone. <laughs> she could only sleep and eat. She lay there on the mattress with her limbs splayed out flat. She has to be turned, see, Tinkerbell. <laughs> or you try. And she creates, she makes a right old racket. And then the neighbors. Lionel said, what do you have a dog for if you let it get into that state? You ought to give it a, uh, an appropriate diet, says Lionel, rather hypocritically, since he feeds his two um, psychopathic pit bulls on uh, mutton vindaloo from the Indian restaurant with masses of taba Tabasco. And then if he has n some nasty job to do the next morning, get some drunk on uh, malt, malt lager. Because he likes them when they're hungover. That's when they're really <laughs> vicious. New shrugged humbly and limped back to his bunk. He had his left leg in a light cast. Pete New had managed to snap a ligament while watching TV. <laughs> Eleven hours in the same position. And when he readied himself to get to his feet, he said he heard it pop. You snapped a ligament watching TV. <laughs> I know, it doesn't sound too clever either. You want to brush up your ideas, mate. Well, you know how it is, Mr. Asburn. Call me Lionel. At two in the afternoon, Officer Phipps came to fetch him. Best of luck, Lionel, said Pete New from his bunk. Asbo sauntered freely down the stone passage. The truth is that Lionel uh, doesn't mind being in prison. And his nephew, Desmond, who goes on to be, become a crime reporter, using his insight into the criminal mind, um, and towards the end of the book asks him why he doesn't mind. And, it, and in fact, this is from Trotsky, of all people, who said he didn't mind um, being in prison in the Peter and Paul fortress in Petrograd, as it then was, before the revolution. But because I have most of my comforts, I have my books, um, and the great thing is I don't have to worry about getting arrested. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what that's, Lionel... That's thinks. pretty much Lionel. Yeah. yeah. He sauntered freely down the stone passage. He was led up four flights of steps, then through a hall, bracingly redolent of vomit and carbolic and then out onto the colonnade with its dripping arches. The governor's door stood wide open. Slight, bald, with frizzled eyebrows and a bulging forehead, Governor Wolf did not at all resemble the bearer of good news, as he said dryly, Ah, here he is, the estimable Mr. Rasbo. I suppose you just plug away at it, don't you, Lionel? Month after month, with your brain hurting, and your tongue sticking out of the corner of your mouth, plugging away at the lottery. Um, Lionel does not do the lottery, and his brother, Ringo, um, has won it twice. He got 10 pounds the first time, and 12 pounds 50 the next. <laughs> the lottery, said Lionel, of course I don't think I'm stupid, and what about it? What about it, said the governor. Lionel barely remembered. He'd only stolen the coupon to give a certain old lag a niggle. And it was all a load of bollocks anyway. He stood there with his hands in his pockets. Governor Wolf, who had long ago stopped trying to make Lionel call him sir, said again, what about it? Sighing, Lionel said, OK, you got me up here because I won 15 quid. It's a mugs game, the lottery, if you ask me. Governor Wolf threw his pencil onto the desk and said, well, I suppose this proves that God's got a sense of humor. Lionel grew alert. It's more than 15 pounds, Asbo. It's a substantial sum. Like a soldier, Lionel went from the at-ease posture to full attention. How substantial? Sir. There's just a last tiny section. Owing to an earlier infraction, Lionel was confined to his cell. But the next morning, Pete New was carted off to the sand for an hour of physiotherapy. And when he came back, he said, you're on the front page of the sun. A 
recumbent Lionel was examining his fingernails. He said, headline? Lionel Asbo, lotto lout. <laughs> Photo, you outside the old Bailey being led away and giving the finger. There's also a, a resume of, of Lionel's criminal record, beginning with a, a mugshot um, and a mugshot full face and profile of Lionel at the age of three. Um, <laughs> Lionel merely shrugged and knew ventured to say, wasn't there a box you could tick, Lionel? You should have ticked it, confidential or whatever. Now you'll never get a moment's peace. I'm not bothered, said Lionel, by the publicity. I can handle it. You know, Pete, the funny thing is, I never done the lottery in all my life. It's a mugs game, if you ask me. Thank you. <laughs> Has English society's relationship to money changed much since you wrote Money and, and created John Self, who is the, he's, he's kind of like the deep Lionel Asbo, isn't he? Yeah, the thoughtful Lionel Asbo. Um, well, only that all that's happened is that money has won as it has everywhere else. Um, but we're still not as strange about money as the Americans. Um, and I, I do think it's extraordinary that the Republicans' only idea so far this century, um, which is al already a proven flop, would never be mentioned, let alone tabled, passed, and given a second term in any other country on earth, i.e. tax cuts for the rich. Anyone else think tax cuts for the rich? Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, while fighting a war, don't forget while fighting a war. Wars. Yeah. Um, absolutely unbelievable notion. Um, and yet, yet an, an American will look you straight in the eye and, and repeat this slogan. And, you know, among the, among the various desperations of the Republican Party is the fact that only 8% of Americans and only 10% of rich Americans only 8% of ordinary Americans think that um, the rich pay too much tax. And I said, who are these, uh, who are these Americans? And an American patiently explained to me that um, they're poor Americans who still hope to be rich, and when they are rich, don't want to pay any tax either. <laughs> While gambling on the, the social safety net being whipped out from underneath them. You know, they're prepared to take that chance. Yeah. Uh, so in England, the levels of inequality are the same as America now. It's back to just after the First World War, the gap. Having slowly, as in America, having slowly narrowed in the post-war decades as now um, a chasm once mm -hmm. again. So you, you, having moved to America, you, America is in Parallel decline? No, it's not parallel, and it has, it has a while to go yet. But, um, but uh, the example of, of all empires is that they, they have, it's like hu human life resembles the tragic mask um, in that uh, the shape of tragedy and the shape of comedy is like this, where you start at a, an even point, enter decline and complication and then emerge for the festive conclusion and in Shakespearean comedy and classical comedy everyone gets married at the end. Um, but the tragic um, parabola is that you rise and then you reach a certain point and then you decline and that is what human life is like too. It, there's something as inevitable about it as uh, our own deaths. Mm. Now, I want, I want to talk about that as well, but just before we do it, you were at the Republican convention. Yeah, and... Um, that must, you must have just thought the place was falling apart, I mean, when you were down there. I did, yeah, I did... What, Tampa, I, right? Yes. A lovely town. Yeah, I, and I did New Orleans when it was um, 
George H. W. Bush and Dan Quayle, and that was a, a drama. Um, <laughs> but it, it, it's a good moment to um, raise that because the Repub Republican nominee is someone who, uh, whose face reveals that he seriously believes he's going to live forever. That, that is a face unhaunted by mortality. Um, <laughs> And that's why he looks like a porn star. Uh, when he was young, he looked like a young porn star. Now he's old, he looks like an old porn, porn star. With that terrible, ageless veneer. Um, and since the Mormon afterlife is, is highly competitive, <laughs> Mitt clearly thinks he's going to do wonderfully well there too. Um, it's a disgraceful religion, Mormon, Mormonism, and not protected by, by time, as, as, the other, as the great monotheisms are. Oh. You know, 15 centuries for Islam, 20 for Christianity, 40 for the Old Testament. Uh, Mormonism was founded on the 8th of April, 1830. One of the dozens of quackeries that got going in uh, the Great Revival. And, uh, it's, it's, it still reeks of tar and feathers. Uh, I'm amazed that, that, that uh, I know it's considered ungallant to mock a man's religion, but um, look at this religion, you know. <laughs> the first prophet, 87 wives, the youngest of whom is 14. Uh, they sided with the South in the Civil War, uh, and there was much violence, much tar and feathers. It's all tar and feathers. And then, um, not until another revelation was, did it, was it divulged by the angel Moroni. <laughs> uh, all it needs is a C on the end. Um, <laughs> that black people had souls. That was in yeah. the 1970s. But the worst thing about it, and the, the reason why it would be a catastrophe if Romney were elected, is that, um, is that it's so provincial. And uh, when, the minute he steps outside America, Romney is utterly ridiculous. Um, excruciating to watch. And that's because he has no world imagination. He's not just tone deaf, he's world deaf. He's never had to think about it. it, it it's never interested him. And there he is. Uh, getting everything wrong, first in London, where Carl Lewis, the great sprinter, said he's the sort of American who shouldn't be get allowed to have a passport. <laughs> um, <laughs> then on to Jerusalem, that is $25,000 fundraiser in the King David Hotel. He sits with Shel Sheldon Adelson on his right, a, a very dodgy casino billionaire. Now, you have to rack your brains to think of someone less reputable than that. <laughs> Perhaps if he'd had uh, Larry Flint on his other side, <laughs> he might have balanced things out. And there, and, and there he is saying what is, what, what's the capital of Jerusalem, getting that wrong. Um, and you realize that this is a man, he's in Jerusalem. This is a man who thinks that the Garden of Eden was located in Missouri. <laughs> Um, you know, in as much as America is lead, a leader of the world, they should, Americans, if they were responsible, would consider who the world would vote for. And I can't, I can't imagine that Romney would get more than a few thousand votes in the, in the whole of Europe. Oh. I, I presume your opinion of Paul Ryan is uh, equally elevated. <laughs> I think you'll find he's, he's called Paul Ron. <laughs> No, no, it should be Paul Ryan, but it's very easy to mix him up with, um, with Ron Paul. <laughs> the physical similarities are not striking, I admit, but um, they're both anti-choice. I think we should start saying that instead of pro-life. Anti-choice libertarians. <laughs> um, and isn't it amazing the way they keep pushing back the point at which um, uh, a fertilized embryo becomes a human being. 
I think they got it as far back now as the candlelit dinner. But they're not just anti-choice libertarians, they both have managed to distill uh, a few predatory slogans from Ayn Rand's unreadable novel. It, it's almost as unreadable as the Book of Mormon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which Mark Twain called uh, ver, ver, liter, literary chloroform. <laughs> and uh, by the way, this is... A, a, a detail, but if if Paul Ryan is blessed with another daughter, he should call her Ein Ryan <laughs> to match Ron Paul's Rand Paul. <laughs> I can see this has consumed many hours of yeah. thought. Yeah. For you. <laughs> yeah.